Round one. Fight. Heroes never die. I'm Commander Shepard, and this is my favorite store on the Citadel. <laughs> I used to be an adventurer like you. Then I took an arrow in the knee. Power, sex, sex, power. They both come down to one thing. Hungry Gamers. Hello, hello, hello! And welcome everyone to the 301st episode of the Hungry Gamers podcast. We are powered by Apit.net and those sexy audio-based legends over at audiotechnica.com. Go get yourself the best in audio-based equipment ASAP. Then come on back and listen to the rest of this episode. I'm your extremely humble host, Brendan White. You can find me just about everywhere at Brendan 8 Bits. And joining me as is tradition, my podcast, Rod or Die, the unknown to my red judge. You can find her on them socials at Miss Allie Hart. Miss Allie Hart, how the bloody hell are you? I'm doing good. Doing good after 300 episodes. Um, So 301. Ugh. Making yeah. sure these old bones work. My, my back is very voice. sore today. Very sore. I got like some pain in my right shoulder for some reason. I don't know why. Slept on it wrong. Yeah. Not not through exercising too hard, that's for <laughs> sure. Maybe it's the lack of exercise. The body's saying, yo, yeah. step it up or we're leaving you. Get that against the yoga, you know, do some stretches and stuff. Make the body, treat the body right because there's going to be a time where it's it's going, it's going to give up and it's going to need all yeah. the help it can get. Yeah, I, I really need to uh, reevaluate my life in that regard in the coming weeks and months. So, uh, yeah, who knows? Once I get my, my Apple Watch Ultra, maybe my <laughs> fitness routine shall commence, Miss Hart. I'm very excited I'm sorry, everyone. to join the Apple Watch <laughs> revolution. And uh, who knows? I'm going to be uh, Mr. Occasionally Fit moving forward. That's, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. If any, any encouragement is good encouragement, especially for a healthy lifestyle. I know some people out there don't like, you know, Apple for whatever reasons and some are very valid and everything like that. But I've been testing out an Apple Watch, ladies and gentlemen, and my my fitness productivity has skyrocketed. Um, so unfortunately, my little my little <laughs> conversation to Brendan has now turned into a sales pitch that he's essentially won him over. So yeah, I'm I'm in. I am I am all in. Um, I love me a watch anyway, and the fact they've got these nice big bold watch faces now, mm-hmm. so it's going to fill that wrist out nicely. I am in like Flynn, um, but. On the direct sort of opposite side of the fitness discussion, I had a hot star fried chicken for dinner last night, Miss Hart. Have you had hot star before? Like the big giant Korean chicken. It's almost like a giant fried chicken nugget in like a little handheld thingy. I feel like I have. There's one in Sydney, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I think I've had it at least once. Okay. So I had that again last night. Fantastic. The salt content is something we're not going to discuss here today because it's not good for you, but... I wanted to just bring up something that just makes me sad. Like when you get home delivery or you get takeout and you know there's like a drink in your combo or your meal yeah. and you ask for a specific type of drink and then you get the complete opposite, there's not many worse feelings related to food than this. So I I said, can I get, you know, I didn't know if they did Coke or Pepsi. So I said, can I get a Pepsi Max or a Coke No Sugar, whatever it might be. Yeah. And then lo and behold, when my hot star got delivered here, it was fucking Fanta. And I couldn't have been more sad. Are you Fanta, kidding? I hate orange soda. It is trash. Sir, how very dare you? Although, <laughs> like, Fanta got worse in Australia because they went under this route where they wanted to include fruit juice. It's like, come on, you're not fooling anyone. This is a soda. Mm. Stop trying. Just like let the sugar in, let the artificial <laughs> flavors go through. Um, so after a while, I just cut out Fanta and did Sunkist. Because um they they kept their, they kept everything the way that they had it yeah. for God knows how long so uh, then Sunkist became the way to go for orange soda but I I love orange soda it's probably one of my favorites yeah I'm not not a big big fan to be honest mm. and I was even more disappointed in it last night because I didn't have any soda in the cupboard or in the fridge I should say so I'm like you know I'll get something. No sugar, so it's like giving me this this false sense of doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. And then I get a dirty can of Fanta in my bag. I was like, fuck, god damn it. So I ended up like, dirty you know, I'm going to say this begrudgingly, but I ended up just having water with my with my hot star, which is fine. But I was set on that wow. Coke No Sugar or Pepsi Max. That's hilarious. I like that you hated the soda so much that you just didn't even just, you know, grit your teeth and just drink it anyway. You 
yeah. subsidize the straight water. Yeah, it's wow. in the fridge now for, for any guest that comes around in the near future that's a orange soda fan. You're welcome to my can of Fanta because I will not touch it. And on the soda discussion, while we're here in this very divisive topic, yeah. remember Lyft? Lyft has been cancelled or like, you know, Cancel? ceased to exist oh, here in Australia. They're, they've got rid of Lyft. Yeah, that's the word. I yeah, Lyft is gone. That's, I feel like they already had something like that where... Solo? No, 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 no. In the sense that Lyft was like, it was a thing. They they were a competitor solo. They would do they would do pretty well. And then I feel like there was this time frame, maybe in the 2000s, where like Lyft kind of disappeared. It wasn't around. And um, and then they had a resurgence and it was popular again, but it seems like they've... um. And now yeah, I'm just remembering on. the ads would tell you to look at the screen and then look at your can of Lyft so, to watch the pattern Lyft. Oh, Remember that's that? Right. <laughs> that's right. It had like that magic eye yeah, stuff going. Yeah, exactly. I just remembered that was their little gimmick. Um, yeah. eh, you know, Lyft was always second fiddle to Solo. I miss Solo. Mm-hmm. Solo's good. It's great because, you know, as, as the slogan says, it's low on fizz so you can slam oh, it yeah. down fast. Yeah. Even my husband so, misses Solo. And the marketing was fantastic for Solo too. The ads that they had in the 90s and 2000s, yeah. chef's kiss. I haven't seen a Solo ad in a long time. But, uh, I don't need it. Because they don't need to advertise now. They're the kings of the, exactly. the lemon soda scene. Oh, so, well, you know, it's still pub squash. Ooh. Oh, I used to hate it when we, you'd want a Solo. It's such an it unnatural coloured soda mm. as well. Yeah, it, it is. looks like that wee you first off. wake up when you're dehydrated. Oh, it's just God. like... Ah, pub squash, keep doing your thing. But uh, speaking of doing our things, we've been both doing the same thing. Yeah. I'm going to just say the word thing again one more time before we jump in here. We've been both playing the the game that's been uh, developed by the outsider. We've both been playing on Games Pass. I've been playing it on the Xbox version. We've been playing on the PC Mm -hmm. version. We're talking about Metal Hellsinger. Miss Hart, I've realized I don't have much rhythm in my my 30s. I have... Managed to to get a good amount of momentum going in this game, uh, probably an hour to an hour and a half in. But oh. that first hour before that, my rhythm was from the town of Footloose. It was not a good. Like, I was loving it, but I just couldn't hit the beat. Like I was enjoying yeah. the world and enjoying the the crunchy metal soundtrack in the background and Troy epic, Baker's yeah. you know commentary in the back and killing all these hell beasts. But I just couldn't get to like those higher multipliers, so the song would really hit the peaks. I was going to say, how long did it? Constantly. How long did it take you to find out that there was actually a singer on the tracks? <laughs> Longer than I care to admit here publicly, Miss Hart. But it took a while. But this game is sick. Is it cool? It's a really great um, angle on the rhythm rhythm games that kind of get made and oh, there's people have like done different variations before obviously i've played a few um mm-hmm. but this one's great because not only has it incorporated like epic metal soundtrack but they've actually reached out to genuine genuine metal like vocalists and musicians and bands and everything like that and gotten them involved and also apparently the the music is d dmca free yeah so you can play this on stream without worrying about getting pinged. Exactly. And then I've seen too, outside of if you don't want it to be metal Hellsinger, you can do like jazz Hellsinger now. And really? like K-pop Hellsinger. They've got mods where you can put different music in from different genres now and play it through again with K-pop blasting or <sighs> jazz and all this. And it's like, mm-mm-mm. I think I want to go through hell listening to K-pop. That just sounds mm-hmm. like a match made in hell. Yeah, I think that works. But this game is so great. Like I got to, I played the demo the second that I found it, that there was a demo available and was pretty much sold instantly. Um, it's, it took me a little bit of time to get onto it since release, um, but have since played it and especially since I found it was on Game Pass. Um, and I, I've enjoyed it because I'm, I, I have that level of difficulty, whereas I'm not breezing through it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, there's hurdles that I'm overcoming, but I'm overcoming them quick enough that I'm not getting frustrated. Um, the only thing I'm going to say that, like, I don't know if it's a negativity or it's just me being um, a bad player, but I'm not really diversifying my weapons. Um, what have you found you've settled on for your weapon? Shotgun main. <laughs> yeah, I, I was rocking the shoddy. 
especially because like because it is a slower shot between that's what i felt i was able to sort of keep a better rhythm with with the shotgun mm. blast it's like boom boom yeah exactly I sort of yeah. had it going with that one as opposed to the to the sword or you know the skull throwing projectile thingamajigger yeah i barely touched the skull as well like if i if i alternate between anything it's the shotgun then i switch to the blade um with certain enemies and then maybe Every now and then I do like the like the like the crossbow looking thing. Um yep, for just yep. for kind of like more area effect kind of thing. So but yeah, no, I, I find myself just sticking to a shotgun and I'm like, is it because like I don't like how the ga- the other guns or sorry, the other weapons feel or you know, is it just because, you know, it's metal, it's you know, it's like doom, you want the crunchy kind of weapon just to get the whole aesthetic going. So but I mean it's, that's that's the smallest thing that I'm going to complain about this game. I, everything else I love. Yeah, it, it's a great time. And like you said, like it, it can be difficult. Like I think there's five difficulty levels, if I could remember right, from booting oh, up. I only saw five, three. three. I can't remember. Yeah. Maybe it is only three. It's like Baby Goat, Goat, and then I can't remember what the hardest one was called. But yeah. Mm. But I played on Goat, like normal Goat yeah. tier. Yeah. And, and it still is challenging. Oh, yeah. Like, there's enemies coming at you from every which way and it's not just the fact that you've got to kill them to survive but you want to kill them in time in the rhythm of the song to get more of those beats and hear those big vocals and the big guitar solos in the background yeah you want that grand scale as you play because you're like a demon trapped in hell and you're just killing your way through to the you know to the devil for all intents and purposes to um you know, escape hell, I guess, is the way you describe it, or just seek vengeance. Like, yeah, you, you're you're a silent. I don't know if you're a protagonist, antagonist, anti-hero, let's say. Yeah. You know, you're a demon, and you're just cruising along, killing everything with an awesome soundtrack laid over the top of it. And graphically, it's not bad. Like, there's some diversity in the locations and in the enemies, and some of the enemies can fuck you up oh, quick. Yeah, yeah. Some of them are frustrating levels of like like levels of difficulty to them that like kind of mess me up but like it's like it's like like the elements that you could enjoy out of like a gears of war or any kind of game that has like a horde mode or like a zombie like you know game where masses of things are kind of running at you so you have that element to it and then as you mentioned like you know not only do you want to obviously kill all these things before you know you die um but you have to you have this ambition to do it in time because every beat that you hit you get your multiplier so multiplier and score but then you also get like multiplier in power so if you maintain that level up then it's just easier to kill things like you know you can one shot um some of the more harder enemies because you know you're maintaining that multiplier um also um as i mentioned before you also get to hear the epic vocals so as as you progress with your multipliers in the game the more you build them the more you stack them the more epic the music gets and to mm-hmm. the final the final you know i think it's time 16 is the Highest multiplier. The crescendo moment. Yeah, yeah. and then you, you get the epic vocals, you get everything. So, um, but don't get me wrong, like the, the very basic music, like the baseline music when you haven't even hit a multiplier is still excellent. It's just you kind of also get that encouragement as you keep on multiplying, as the music gets yeah. more epic and the vocals get added and some chunky guitars get added. Like it's it's a great experience for like very, I guess, semi-basic combat, like that you're probably mm-hmm. very used to in other games. So just shoot the things, you know. I can confidently confirm that that just that baseline music is very good because I heard that a lot. I didn't often get to the big 16 <laughs> time epic vocal soaring moments. I was just hearing that chugga chugga <laughs> for a good portion of my early gameplay and it was still awesome, but it, like like you said Ali that uh it pushes you to try and hit those rhythm timings so you can get the multipliers so you can hear this song peak as your combat abilities do and when it all is hitting the same note and the multipliers are popping and the viscera is flying it is awesome it is so good and it's just such a big wow like huge mountaintop moment and yeah it's it's a surprise hit for this year this game came out of nowhere was uh announced and then released very swiftly like it got announced obviously the demo like dropped like the next day or something i think i think it was the same day 
I think. Yeah, yeah, which is awesome. And now a few months later, the game is out in full across multiple platforms. Uh, unlucky for PlayStation users, it's 50 bucks in the PlayStation Store, but it's included in the Game Pass Store and obviously you can get it on Steam as well. But yeah, I think it's well worth your time. It is a ton of fun. I'm not a big rhythm guy, obviously because I just said that I don't have much explaining my uh, explaining my, my rhythmic prowess here on the show, but I've been really enjoying the challenge and just the melding of other universes that I love, like the metal with this sort of dark fantasy aspect with first person combat and then just this rhythm layer sprinkled over the top. It is a really, really cool melting pot of ideas and it just really works. Yeah. And like art style conceptually is, is really put together. I loved finding out about the, the, the main character that you follow and then the, the enemies and the bad guy, the a bad girl, the 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 baddie, the, the judge, um, mm, the and red judge. yeah, and just following along with that, and they they don't try to push too much story onto you, like they know what you're there for, but um, yeah. they kind of give you some kind of sense of direction of what's happening. So, mm, I'd say I'd say myself as as an amateur with rhythm fan, I'd say this is definitely an eight bit approved game. Would you oh, agree? Oh, one hundred percent, yeah. Ooh, baby. So check out Metal Hellsinger on Game Pass, on PlayStation, and on Steam, depending on where you pick your poison. Miss Hart, I see you've been playing another little ditty as well. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I haven't really had the opportunity to speak too much on this. It's been out for a bit, but um, returned back to Splatoon 3. Um, and I just wanted to say that it's just as good as I remember Splatoon being. Um, they've added, like, little changes, a few extra stores, some... Um, uh, some their newer game modes. Um, we recently had Splatfest, which incorporated a third team. Usually it was always one or two, but this time they incorporated a third team. Um, I don't like the... There's usually a team of characters that kind of welcome you into the game and update you about certain things. I like the one from Splatoon 2. Um, it was caught off the hook, but anyway. Um, also coming to this realization that I guess it kind of makes sense, but it was, it's been really confronting. In Splatoon, you create your own character and you can dress your character in certain things. Um, but you also have this little bubble above your head mm -hmm. where you can do a custom artwork like you can design like a little art piece and have that bubble on top of your head to kind of like you know set some individuality or represent something that you know about yourself or it's things that you're into and what i am finding out is splatoon has a lot of furries um <laughs> like a lot um and i was kind of like i'm like oh 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 um because it's a kid's game and that's all well and good. Like most, most of the artwork's fine, but there's just been a few um, where I'm kind of like, oh no, very suggestive yes. scenarios playing out. Okay. Yes, yes, and I was just kind of like, it, it was kind of like, and I felt bad too because I introduced Splatoon to a friend, <laughs> and so the friends like load into the game and just got hit with some. Some very interesting details, like straight to the game, and then I'm like, "Yeah, I like this game," and then that's the first thing they see. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, "Well, you know, other people like this game too." So you know, we're a mixed community, but it's it's still so it's very much the Splatoon that you know if you played Splatoon two with a few little extra elements, a few different weapons, customization. Um, but it's been good. It's been pretty solid. Um, the Nintendo has been handling the online play pretty well. Um, Something that That's Nintendo hasn't really been known for. Yeah, because um, Splatoon, the franchise, especially now on the Switch, it has got such a very devout online community. So you need strong. to nail that online presence, right? Strong, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't play it the day of. I only played it like a few days after launch and people were already <laughs> massive, massive levels ahead and already had a bunch of things unlocked and were kicking my ass. Um but yeah, for so for anyone that's familiar with Splatoon and they were wondering if they should get it, if you liked, if you enjoyed your time with Splatoon two, yeah, jump on the three because um the community's there, it's very lively and everyone's um everyone's been playing like they haven't had any issues with loading into a game or not having enough players, um and the Salmon Run, which is a different kind of game style, has also been really fun as well. So been enjoying that. Nice, nice. Yeah. So I um <clears throat> I've gone back. Because, yeah, it has been a couple of weeks between sort of mainline episodes of THG, so we haven't mm. talked about a lot about what we've been doing and saying. So I'll just quickly say 
I've binged all of Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Fantastic. Check it out on Netflix. ASAP. One of my new favorite animes of the year. Just everything about it. Mm-mm, big thumbs up. Definitely 8 bit approved. But on the back of that, I got the itch to jump back into Night City. So I fired up Cyberpunk 2077 this week. Mm. Heap of updates have since been rolled out since we've played. Like I haven't touched this since we did the spoiler cast in Oof. like December of 2020, I think, if my maths is correct. Sounds so right. it's been a long while. And I jumped back in and, yep, it's noticeably prettier. Uh, some of the, the ray tracing and the textures are certainly better. There's a heap of new cross-pollination with stuff from Edge Runners that weaves into that world and secrets you can find, which is awesome. There's new gigs and things you can do, which is awesome. But it's funny because within the first 45 minutes of me firing it up, I had two bugs oh, no. that I had never experienced <laughs> when I was playing it like two years ago. They were, they were minor ones. One, like um, I was doing doing a, a mission... And I got to this scene, I'm talking to this this sort of like ex-war vet who's sort of bordering on cyber psychosis. Yeah. And we have this situation and he like picks up his shotgun and like points it at me. Yeah. But the shotgun didn't load in. So he's just standing there with his arms like shaking it around like this, threatening me with a with invisible weapon, which I had a <laughs> chuckle about. And then another enemy I fought about 10 minutes later, uh, somehow like disappeared and reappeared and was stuck in the, the bonnet of a car. So, like, he couldn't get out and couldn't chase me and I could just see, like, from his torso up in the car. He could still hit me and I could still hit him. But they were two bugs that happened to me within, yeah, the first half an hour. But outside of that, I played for maybe four or five hours this week, maybe six hours pending, just cleaning up old quests, playing these new quests. It feels great, looks great, love the world. It's been really pleasant to get back into and I can't wait for the the next-gen expansion that's dropping next year with johnny silverhand coming back and i'm hankering for some more cyberpunk have you been tempted to jump back in at all has it sort of uh nearly swayed you to to go back to night city well yeah i um as soon as we heard about the next gen update i I did load into it and um started up a new character and a male character doing um it wasn't nomad it was the other one city Street street kid that's it um, and I, I did churn some hours into that, but then my Xbox broke. Um, <laughs> and so then that's what kind of like halted me. But I, I've watched one episode of um, uh, Edge Runners and I, I enjoyed it. And I am assuming that once I watch all of it, I am going to desperately want to probably get back in. But now I kind of want to play it on PC. Mm. I want to see what it's that's tempting. like. Yeah, yeah. But- it's so pretty though, this game. Like it was... It was stunning when we talked about it a few years yeah. ago, but just these additional tweaks and dial-ups they've done since then, it is such a cinematic experience. And running around Night City of a nighttime and the neon and the light reflection and refraction and all even, that is just... Mm. Even driving out to like the desert area and you get those like little... Like little like bits of like civility where there's like some lights or or there'd be none or there'd be just like weird like buildings or just a, a gang driving past and stuff like i loved how they designed like designed that um the city and surrounding um areas it was it was a great way to explore without feeling too stagnant um and it was just sometimes it was just one of those games where you could just just drive, not have a mission, just drive and see what you find and play the tunes. And oh, the, the, the radio stations in this game are phenomenal. Yeah. Like I was blaring that. I was doing the same. I was like out on the outskirts, out in like the deserty areas near all the solar arrays and stuff. Yeah, Music was blaring. I was fanging around in my Johnny Silverhand Porsche 911 <laughs> Carrera, having a good time. And I've sort of respect my character too to lean more into the hacking thing. So now I can just sort of find somebody use some of like the, the plague uh, abilities you have and it just like jump like the, the, the virus, pains just yeah. jump from person to person with the viruses and the infections and it's so good yeah it's so good i i, I did the same thing um i did start gravita- gravitating towards the hacking because it just seemed like it was the most useful you were able to get into a mm-hmm. lot of areas that you um couldn't get into um, i remember my husband put all of his stuff into hacking from the get-go and he stopped playing because he was too overpowered so <laughs> he just kind I of i can see how that can challenge. happen yeah there was no challenge yeah. so 
Um, but yeah, I, I really do want to get back in there and just kind of chill. But now I kind of have to decide, do I do I get it on PC or do I pick up where I left off on the Xbox? Since hopefully mm. the save should be in the cloud, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Two, got some options there. Um, I don't know if, if it's... Cr- like I saw something about it's either coming or maybe it's going to be enabled as far as the cross save. So you might be able to pull it across, especially oh, on the back of now the okay. the Stadia stuff, uh, which we'll talk about in a little while. So so maybe there's some facility there to, to import your Xbox save onto PC and hmm. you can keep rolling around Night City. Maybe. It's so good though. It's so good and I'm still loving life. And the other game I've been playing, uh, we've been, we've been, oh, well, I've been hankering for a new Snap game for quite a while. Obviously that is the, the mobile term for, or the term we use for mobile gaming. And it's funny because I've started playing Marvel Snap and I cannot get enough of this game, Miss Hard. It's, it's a very simple um, CCG. It is, uh, there's, a, there's a pool of 150 cards that you can unlock. You don't have to pay a penny. Um, in this game, you can just grind your way through and unlock all these cards. And the way it works is you build a deck of 12 cards uh, from various characters of the Marvel Universe. And they're um, you know scored different with either... Um, like Because there's six rounds you play. And each round you get an extra, extra amount of um, life force to play certain cards. So in round one, you can only play level one cards. Round two, two, so on and so forth. Mm. And... Um, They have certain abilities, some are ongoing where, you know, they'll give plus two power to every other card that's out or in your deck. And, you know, there's there's, um, buffs and nerfs for the cards you play. So you you synergize your deck accordingly to how you want to try and play. And it's really fun. It's really simplistic. The games are super quick. Like you can finish games within three to five minutes max, max. So you can churn through a couple of games super quick because it's just six rounds you're playing against real people. When it starts up, you will play a couple of bots here or there just as it allows you to find yeah. your footing. But from there, you can be churning through games within a couple of minutes and there's an ability, like there's an option at the top of the game where there's like a, a cube and if you feel confident or you want to try and potentially like scare your opponent, you can click that cube and it's going to multiply the amount of points you're going to win or lose depending on obviously if you're the victor or the loser. So you can start playing chicken where either you've got a really good hand and you're feeling real confident. You hit that multiplier and be like, all right, I'm, I'm feeling cocky here. And you watch some people because there's an option to retreat so you lose uh, the minimal amount of experience. So there's this sort of game of chicken as well as the game of cards that you're playing which just adds this other little wrinkle. Also and- sounds like gambling. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Like you don't, you don't pay like the XP you're losing or gaining. You're not paying for, but yeah, it is. It is. A, it's a bluff. You could say it's like poker yeah. in a way, where yeah, you're pu- pushing your chips in, and whether you've got a great hand or a or a dud hand, it's up to yourself. But it's really fun. Like the way the game is is broken down. You obviously yeah, twelve hands in your in your um or twelve cards in your hand, and then there's three zones that you can drop the cards in. And each one of those zones, match to match, will vary. So some zones it might be, um, you know, cards have plus five power in this one. Other ones could have negative. Other ones could be 25% chance you lay a card down and it can be blown up and be taken out or it's going to clone the abilities and stuff. So there's all these variations and multipliers each game coupled with the the, the buffs and the nerfs of the cards that makes every game really fresh and unpredictable. But mm. it's super fun. It's super simple and... The fact that you can churn these games out really quick, it is like the perfect snap game. Like you can do a couple of games with your morning poo, easy done. <laughs> you can do it on your commute. You can do it in Don't between do meetings, it, oh, whatever it is. Yeah. Super quick. Yeah. I was gonna- and the card art, stunning. You can upgrade the cards as well. So like they, you know, break out of the card frame, then they become three dimensional and they're animated and stuff. Like it's really, really pretty. They're using proper like art and then variations from comics and various universes so it's really really cool these decks and i've been loving it it's super fun and it's on ios it's on um android as well and yeah it's free it makes me miss hearthstone yeah it's it's like a sped up baby version of hearthstone in a kind of way the fact that these games just take no time it's just a perfect little time sink when you looking for something to do or maybe you're loading in or in a queue for a game of Apex or Fortnite or something, you can just slap a game out of this as you're waiting. Like sounds it's like, super fun. <laughs> sounds like someone's uh, basing that up experience. Can confirm. Can confirm. <laughs> 
But so good, so good. Marvel Snap, love it. It's got a high level of polish. Newverse, who uh, developed this game, have done really, really well with it. And um, yeah, it's it's a big part of my day-to-day gaming rotation just because you can slam these games out super quick and the progression system is simple to follow and the fact that you can unlock the cards as you go, it's great. Snap game. Snap game. Marvel Snap. The Snap game of 2022. And I just wanted to quickly shout out off your recommendation. I finally got around to watching Welcome to Wrexham this week. Oh, yeah. I think, I can't remember if they're up to 10 or 11 episodes, but I binged all of them in the one night. Uh, I regret nothing. It is fantastic, fantastic, fantastic television. Yeah. I, I could not give a rat's ass about football, but I care and will die for the Wrexham Football Club now. Like, I am so invested and so in on this show and the people around it. And obviously, Rob and Ryan, phenomenal work, especially with the edit. Like, the way they've made this documentary oh, yeah. and the way that it's shot and the characters they bring in, the people I interview, like, it is phenomenal. And I am addicted. Even the episode where, like, for the most part, the show's like a documentary following uh, Rob and Ryan and them buying this team. But then it also cuts down to, cuts to, like, the, either the players of Wrexham or the community, like, little people who maybe volunteer for the football club or just fans in general. So, for the most part, you're following all these people around but then there's this one episode where they just cut and there's rob and ryan like teaching you welsh things because oh, so good. <laughs> and it was such a it was such a left field like episode but it was still great like it didn't mess things up too much and rob and ryan are hilarious why they are not in more things together you know it absolutely baffles me so um i don't know maybe we'll see rob in uh deadpool maybe Maybe. Um, or maybe Ryan will do a cameo in Mythic Quest or something. I thought you were say Always Sunny. There's a free guy bleed over there from the video game world. Who knows? I don't want to see Ryan in Always Sunny. That would be messed up. Oh, yeah. Um, but I'm glad you liked it. Like, it's it, it's kind of a weird, uh, like, hard sell to maybe, like, people who don't enjoy, like, football slash soccer um, or any of the, like, British leagues or anything like this over the pond. But... Um, it, it's it's more than that, and there's a lot of like levels to it that you can kind of appreciate, and there's like a lot of heart and wholesomeness. So, mm-hmm. um, I'm glad that you took the recommendation and actually enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, I it hooked me from the jump, and and yeah, those two together are just magnetic. And it's crazy to think that they never met in person mm. until like after they spent however many millions, millions buying yeah. a football club. Like, it's it's nuts to see, but it's kind of cool to to see behind the curtain of this purchase process and all the the drama that comes with that and then the day-to-day running of a football club and mixing that in with their celebrity lifestyles and all that. But it's, it's like you said, it's so wholesome and it's got so much heart and that sort of bottle episode about, uh, you know, the like the history of Wales and mm. learning Welsh and all that and the the lady they bring on that does the um interpreting the cooking with yeah. them and the interpreting she is phenomenal she's great she is a star yeah. I love her in, in everything she's been in, in in that show and yeah I'm hooked and I can't and they, wait for they, the next episode they brought out um Charlotte Church um yes. any Aussie growing up in the fucking 90s is that what, or early 2000s? I'd say the 90s, maybe late 90s. Charlotte Church was the shit. Like, uh, she was very popular. She was a little, she was a young girl um, singing opera and like sold CDs like Michael Bublé, you know, like uh, she was such a thing and then just kind of like faded. Um, so it was great seeing her appear on the show as well. And I kind of had to explain to my husband her significance and how much of an impact mm-hmm. she had in Australia for that time. So. Yeah, she is the the Tina Arena of uh, of Wales, yeah. and then some. Yeah. You'd say like because she was global, like she blew up globally, and yeah, it's just it's so well done, and you can see these two care so much. Yeah, I think that's what makes me care so much about the show as well that it's not just a celebrity cash in where they've just thrown some money at something for the sake of it. Like they genuinely want this club to succeed, and I do too. God damn it, I. Don't know if I'll wake up at some ungodly hour to ever watch a Wrexham game, but I will live through this show and maybe buy a scarf to show some support. And yeah, I can't wait to see what happens with this team and this show into the future. Yeah, I, I hope I hope we get to see more after it finishes its its season or whatever. Like it was just it, like you said, it was really edited and created and put together really really well. 
Um, so I, I, I am worried that like once we kind of get an end of season, it, that'll be it. It'll be a, like a bookend kind of thing. Maybe it will work. Maybe you'll feel good. But, you know, when you enjoy something so much and then to find out mm. that it's and then it's getting, you know you get a little disappointed you feel like yeah, you're missing that's, out that's my concern too like these these are two very busy individuals with so many things on their plates on the small and oh, big yeah. screens so i wonder if they'll be able to fit more seasons into this on their plate i hope so because i'd love to watch this for years to come to just see where this club ends up and if they you know finally grab that brass ring and, and manage to have some long-term success and whatnot. Cause it is an underdog story it and is. everyone loves a good underdog story. Yeah. And uh, yeah, welcome to Rexham on Disney plus cannot speak highly enough of that. It's so good. All right. Quick bit of housekeeping, Miss Hart, obviously ko fi.com forward slash we are eight bit. If you wanted to support us monetarily, you can do so over there. Uh, but if you want to get some new merchandise on your person, including our new idol design shop 8bit.net is the place to go for tees hats hoodies aprons pillows socks jocks you name it it is all there shop 8bit.net check out that idol design i adore it i am such a big fan miss hart and john i think just tolerate it due to my anime fandom but uh i think it came out really good i woke up to it like (laughs) i woke up to the design you kind of, you kind of you kind of just like went for it and then said hey guys and we're like hey, I mean Brendan did it yeah this makes sense this is very on brand brand Brendan Brandon Brendan I was trying <laughs> to say brand. on brand but add Brendan but no, it just makes on, it on brand yeah on brand mm. we'll, we'll workshop that yeah workshop that I think, one. <laughs> I think there's some good, good good opportunities there but yeah it's so good the idol design is available right now at shop 8bit.net so to quickly shout out the winner of our ATM 50 X BT to deep sea audio technica wireless headphone giveaway. And that is going out to Yasmin. Uh, you should receive a message or an email from us in the coming Ooh. days so we can get your shipping info, but congratulations Yasmin for winning that sexy, sexy, sexy limited edition deep sea. M50 set of phones. Mm, mm, mm. We're also still running an ATH GL3 gaming headset giveaway as well. All you've got to do to go into the draw for that is simply send us a screenshot of your rating or review for The Hungry Gamers or any of the other official 8-bit podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your podcast player of choice to go into the draw to win an ATH GL3 wired gaming headset in white or black from our friends over at Audio Technica. But Miss Hart, let's get into this. This week's news headlines. Quick bit of news to begin the proceedings here. Twitch is testing a feature where viewers can pay up to 100 US dollars to highlight a message in chat. Elevated chat, as it's known, is currently a limited time experiment for four weeks, only available for select streamers, and it is similar to YouTube's super chat function. It allows viewers to pay to, in air quotes, elevate their message in chat, either pinned to the top of chat or at the bottom of the video player. Varying payment amounts allow for various amounts of time for elevation. That ranges from $5 for 30 seconds of elevation to $100 for just 2.5 minutes of elevation. The revenue split of this is 70 to 30 in the streamer's favor, but only after fees and tax. Miss Hart, are you thumbs up or thumbs down on this yes. cash grab from Twitch? This is a major thumbs down. I When I read $5 for 30 seconds of elevation, I think any person of any background would tell you that that's a bad time. Um, this... Like this obviously also kind of piggybacks after the announcement from Twitch and all the changes that they made um, and them crying poor or, you know, whatever they wanted to say was the issue on why they were going to start changing payouts um, for streamers. And then this also follows after that where they decided to announce for TwitchCon they got the Stallion. Mega the Stallion. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, that person. Uh, I, I'm not too familiar. Apparently, she was in the Hulk. She was. She did a little cameo in She Hulk. Yeah. Fantastic episode. Fantastic show. I love She Hulk, by the way. Oh, I haven't. I, 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 it's funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but you know, so for for Twitch to then first say like, "Hey guys, we're 
we're we're crying poor. Things are expensive. Hosting things are expensive. We're going to start cutting um, how much we're going to pay out people, and that's going to change. Sorry. Then like then they announced that they got Megan the Stallion for a TwitchCon party, along with some other people. Um, you know, as a musical guest for the Twitch party. So then people were like, "You don't have money, but then you do have money." Um, and then then following it up with this, I'm assuming what is a like a light band aid. Um, Mm -hmm. also details of, um, one of the higher ups at Twitch left and I think they cited that there's, um, a lot of changes in the upper management that are just money hungry. Um, so this, like this, this specific thing is just a thumbs down to me. It's a, it's an attempt where they try to make it look like it was going to help out, um, streamers by doing the revenue split. But it, it doesn't matter. Like, like you're just hoping, you're just like predator, like preying on those people who want to go to bigger streamers, and they they want this, you know, their name to be mm-hmm. seen, their name to be read, their, you know, their presence to be acknowledged. So they're gonna drop too much money for that. Too much yeah, money. It's, it's it's scary. I'm a big old thumbs down on this too, because yeah, it is predatory. Where yeah, you think of those big you know elite of the elite streamers where their chat is just million miles an hour and these people want their message seen by their favorite streamer so they're going to drop five dollars to a hundred dollars to get their little message seen and acknowledged just for that serotonin that little bit of validation you know that that energy bump that uplift to their emotions for the for 30 seconds or two and a half minutes. And it's, it's really gross. Mm. It's, it's not the same thing, but it reminds me back in the day when after 11 PM at night, the phone sex ads would always <laughs> pop on. Yeah. And I think of this where I'm like, they're just playing, preying on desperate, lonely people that need some fake validation for some ungodly Actually, yeah. minute based rate. That's what this is for me. This is the modern day phone sex line. It feels like, and I don't like it. Go away with this Twitch. Go away with this YouTube with your super chat and your elevator chats. It's gross and we can't stand it over here. Get out. Twitch elevation chats start from $5 for 30 seconds <laughs> and then $100 for every 2.5 minutes. <laughs> Call me now. <laughs> Elevate your chat now. <laughs> gross. Gross Twitch. Thumbs down from both of us. Get on out of here. Uh, the next news is also not very good. Uh, Ubisoft has delayed its long-awaited pirate game, Skull and Bones, yet again, this time until the 9th of March of 2023. Originally revealed back in 2017 and in, de- and in development since 2013, the project's launch has been repeatedly pushed back and most recently was expected to arrive in November of this year. In yesterday's press conference, uh, in yesterday's press release, Ubisoft said, while the game development is finished at this stage, the extra time will be used to further polish and balance the experience using players' feedback from our technical tests and insider program, which happened over the past two weeks. This is the right decision both for our players and for the long-term success of the game as 9th of March 2023 provides for a suitable release window for this very unique new brand, end quote. So the polish thing makes sense. You'd never want a game to come out a bit busted and undercooked. Fake, but yeah. also this was trying to come out in the same week of God of War Ragnarok, Ooh, yeah. which was very silly on Ubisoft's behalf as well. So it's interesting that they mentioned the suitable release window in the little press release as well because they probably realized we're going to tank this game because ain't no one going to talk about it during the month of November yeah. because of God of War and, you know, you've got Call of Duty season and all that kind of crap that happens there as well. So, yeah, Skull and Bones, which I'm very meh on as it is, I'm even more meh on it now knowing that this game is just in eternal development hell. Yeah, I mean, we, we're we always behind companies taking the time that they need to release a game that they're happy with. Obviously, we assume that... Yeah, the the God of War, and then a pretty um, pretty full, and, and it's the end of year as well, so it must be mm-hmm. extremely difficult to be really grabbing eyes as the year kind of ends out. I, like for me, I'm, I'm this one's not on my radar anyway, so these changes of I don't affect me too much. The March 2023 though seems like a choice. Um, I mean, the first half of the year is still pretty busy. Um, 
like I, I think it is, it is it February or is it March or May? One of those months is full. Maybe it's February. I know that a lot of things can be moved to Feb. Yeah, so we've got Dead Island 2 in February. Mm-hmm. We've got Wild Hearts in February, Hogwarts Legacy in February. Yeah, Skull and Bones in March, Zelda's in March. And then we've got other ones, you know, like your Redfall and your Starfield. We don't have a, a confirmed date for either of those two Bethesda-based games yet. But, yeah. um, you know, they could fall into that March, like that Q1 window as well. So it's going to be a bit of a bit of a hot start to the year. And, yeah, I think, I think this is going to come home with a bit of a wet sail, it feels like, the old Skull and Bones. Good wording. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's it's gonna be, it's it's gonna be a choice. Like uh, the market, they're, they're obviously trying to hit like the, you know, the oh my gosh, the game escapes me. Why can't I think of what the game's called? The pirate game, Sea of Thieves. Um, yes, Sea of Thieves. Like I'm even gonna say like New World, kind of like kind of cluster mm-hmm. of people. Um, but. I'm, I just don't see them having an extensive reach on people kind of gravitating towards this kind of game. There's bits of it that look cool, but there's still a lot of it where I'm kind of like, oh, I'm still not getting like what what the what the overall gameplay experience is going to be like. So I'll, I'll wait and see what other people say and I guess review season as well when that happens. Yeah, the fact that it's just all naval-based combat is Mm. just what bores me like there's no you know like this this was the breakaway piece from assassin's creed black flag back in the day where it is you know you're a pirate you're sailing the seven seas there's sea battles but you could board the ships and then fight with melee weapons you could run around and freely explore on your own two feet where this the boat is the character outside of being in your pirate den with all your pillages and plunderings but uh I just don't get it. It's just not for me. Yeah. It's not for me. Not for me either. Yeah, but the next one I think is collectively for both of us. And EA Motive's Dead Space remake will be one sequential shot from beginning to end, according to a new EA blog post. The post reads as follows. From the moment you start the game to the moment you end the game, there are no camera cuts or load screens wow. unless you die, says senior producer Philippe Ducharme. The Ishimura is now fully connected so you can walk from point A to point Z, visit the entire ship and revisit location you've already completed to pick up things you might have missed. That's all new. It's now a completely unbroken experience, end quote. Incredible. So this this is done similarly to the most recent God of War game and I'm assuming God of War Ragnarok is going to follow that same beat where it's just that one continuous shot. So this is going to be intense. Like yeah. There was some new screenshots shared this week. And it looks stunning. It looks horrifying. And knowing this is all just going to be one continual shot around Isaac on the Ishimura, like I am so in for this. But you kind of have the safety of loading, <laughs> you know, when it comes to scary games. There's a there's a nice little uh, like, nice little nest of safety that whenever you see like a loading screen or you see the little thing in the corner going off, you're like, oh, good, we're going to about to cut to something. And, you know, whereas this is going to be just yeah like it's still incredible like having gaming experiences like this where we're just big open spaces no no cuts no stops no no hurdles just continual exploration and experience it's incredible it's great um just in horror games i think just some of us maybe want a break (laughs) yeah you need a second to catch your breath in horror games so i'm hoping that I'm hoping the pause button will be like a true pause, not just those ones sometimes where it'll bring up a menu, but the game's still still live in the background. background. (laughs) So, yeah, because some of these hell beasts that you're going to be dealing with on the Ishimura, like I remember some of the certain enemy archetypes playing Dead Space, uh, the early iterations of this this franchise, and they are nightmare fuel times 100. So I can only imagine how creeped out and disturbed we're going to be with this. Um, it's funny because I know like over the last few months, we've been talking Callisto protocol a lot Mm. and how it feels like Callisto protocol is going to eat dead spaces lunch coming out a few months earlier, but this sequential shot confirmation, as well as just some of the screens and stills we're seeing is building up my confidence again with this, this dead space remake. I mean, 
obviously it's easy to kind of say it's a it's a competitive it's a you know comparable kind of you know game to game situation but the other thing that we can take from it is is that if both games do well both games succeed and have a lot to show for then um Fans of the genre um, will get to experience more. We will start seeing studios kind of branch out even more into horror, scary, thriller-based games. Um, hopefully they don't like just stick to one thing and then run it into the ground, which they probably will. But like when we see game styles succeed, and especially ones that we love and enjoy, then that only influences the market to then keep creating those kind of games. So yeah, they can you can kind of say like, oh, you know, this against that. But I mean, we just I personally want them to both succeed so we can just get more scary shit out there. I'm with you. Yeah, like <clears throat> a rising tide raises many ships, as they say. Yeah. So I want them both to come out and review well and do well from a sales perspective and i can't wait to be equal parts happy and terrified playing both of these games with callisto protocol in december and this coming out in like q1 of 2023 we've got a lot of space horror coming our way in a very short time miss hart yeah especially especially all the ones uh, the extra trailers that we kind of witnessed during summer games fest and the microsoft ex- microsoft show i believe it was or maybe it was the playstation one but we saw a lot of scary space a lot of scary space. And also we've got, uh, you know, something we'll mention a bit later that uh, we're very excited about coming out a little bit earlier, which is very exciting for you and I yes. and other gamers. All right. The next bit of news I've titled, here comes the money. And we've got the words money. here from Eurogamer. I've cherry picked and it reads as follows. Saudi Arabia's Savvy Games Group owned by the state sovereign wealth fund has announced its intention to invest 142 billion reals, which is 32 billion euro, which is roughly about 50 billion Australian into the video game industry as part of the country's wider initiative to diversify its economy away from oil. The highlight of this new investment package is 50 billion reals, which is 12 billion euro, which is roughly, you know, 20 billion Australian, earmarked for the acquisition of a leading video game publisher to become a strategic development partner. Another 70 billion reals, 16 billion or roughly 25 billion Australian, is pegged for minority stakes in other companies, while the rest will be spent targeting industry disruptors and mature industry partners to enhance Savvy's portfolio. And then we've got a quote here from them directly. Savvy Games Group is one part of our ambitious strategy aiming to make Saudi Arabia the ultimate global hub for the games and esports sector by 2030. And that quote was from Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, We are harnessing the untapped potential across the esports and games sector to diversify our economy, drive innovation in the sector, and further scale the entertainment and esports competition across uh, offerings across the kingdom. Back in June, SVG bought an 840 million euro, or roughly $1.1 billion stake in Embracer Group, which was followed by a statement from its boss on why it accepted the investment. And then in May, the group bought a 5% stake in Nintendo. To say Saudi Arabia's investment in the video game industry has been controversial has been an understatement. Core to the controversy in the kingdom's poor human rights record, uh, core to the controversy is the kingdom's poor human rights record, which includes the criminalization of homosexuality, fuel rights for women, and the use of the death penalty. The Saudi state and its effective ruler, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, has been blamed for the assassination of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi, by US intelligence agencies as well. So, Miss Hart, this is this is a bit scary. Obviously, they're talking about a lot of blood money here to potentially try and disrupt and redirect some of the broader games industry here. And they've got a war chest that they're spruiking to make a big time investment. Like they're talking about $20 billion Australian to pick up you know, an EA or a Ubisoft or whoever, you know, they're they're talking about a big leading game publisher that they want to try and snag here. And they're some of the names that come to mind. Um, It's scary, Miss Hart. It's it's a little little worrisome because, uh, yeah, Saudi Arabia and the Savvy Games Group, I don't think I want them too more involved in my games. This is, you know, feeling very Tencent-esque where we've got the Chinese and the Saudis getting involved with their... Dirty money, for for lack of a better term, and changing something that we love and adore 
heavily, which I do not like. Uh, the bottom line is that it all comes down to choice, right? Like they are out there with money saying, look, we've got it. Here it is. Like this, these are investments we want to do. It's essentially on the other side of companies, groups, teams, etc., that have to make that choice on whether they want to sign up with it. They they know all the connections. They know the you know the essentially the bad name that comes with them. Um, so it's it's in the people that whether they make the choice to actually follow through and uh, sign up to this. I know that there was a esports team that did catch a lot of flack um, because they I think they either did sign up or they agreed to a competition. Um, that was being set up there and um, a lot of um, female esports players were like well I hope you're not expecting us to go over there because we're not we're not we're not welcome over there kind of thing um, and then there's also players um, you know other players that are like their sexuality is impacted by their laws and their you know their, essentially all the human rights issues that they deal that they have attached to them it's it just all comes down to choice and people, you know, either standing against um, supporting them or, you know, unfortunately big companies. I don't know. I don't know how much goes into um, like the purchase point of, um, you know, buying companies and such. Obviously, America has some things that kind of investigate purchases of large companies and large transactions in that way but I don't know how it works on a global level where a company from another country is you know uh, Ubisoft that's technically not strictly American is it yeah that's a European company so, so yeah I don't know how regulated that will be in a purchase like so yeah and you know, bringing up 10 sentences is, is kind of similar um and yeah we just yeah, it's just the it's just these people, these these groups, these countries, these people in positions that have the money, and whether they are able to get away with their purchases and saturating the the market with their their money and making um uh, making their um uh, what they have to offer more appealing than um the, you know the their their bad behaviors or bad practices. So that that's the tough part. Like it's that whole adage, like can you disconnect the art from the artist, you know, where controversial people, like you think of a lot of the stuff in like in cinema and TV is this one where, you know, an actor or an actress turns out to be a piece of shit human, mm. but the movies or the shows they're in, you really adore. And can you disconnect that horrible real life person from the great performances or the, the piece of media they've created in general? And that's what some of this might come down to in similar beats with you know 10 cent and things where the overarching company that's going to control these businesses that make games we adore will be a piece of shit and can you can you turn the other way to continue to support the studios that you love making the games that you adore like you see the whole scenario with you know a lot of people jumping ship with with activision blizzard and, and all the constant atrocities you hear there with with upper management being not good human beings and, and it's like at the end of the day you vote with your wallet if you if you take a strong enough stance you can just abandon ship and and put that money elsewhere into other games and media but if you can sort of turn a blind eye and support the people from ground level that are just wanting to make games you know there is good people in these companies that all they want to do is make their art and have the world enjoy it you can back them but then there is this this murky top layer where it does get a little uncomfortable, the Savvy Games group and Tencent and such. And I'm very, very curious to see who they ultimately end up purchasing. Like it sounds like they're going to be putting, you know, buying stakes in several companies with that, you know, 25 billion they've got aside there, but that's 20 odd billion to, to purchase a single company. I'm very interested to see who that is over the next 12 or so months once it, probably gets made official because I doubt the Saudis are going to take a backward step and say, you know what, we decide this isn't going to happen anymore. I think this is going to happen. It's inevitable, but who it's going to be is going to be anyone's guess. EA, Ubisoft, I don't know. Yeah, I guess we'll find out when we find out. Yeah, but 
yeah, it's interesting. Very interesting. And the last bit of news, we've actually got, this has been a pretty negative news week for us. <laughs> we've been covering, covering a lot of sad and uh, bittersweet news articles that have popped up in this, this week. And the next one, the, the title I've named, it's not the best. It's not the best work I've done. Say this it. is at 1am and I said, see you later, <laughs> which is, um, yeah, see you later. Wordplay on Google Stadia. Uh, so, yeah, Google is shutting down Stadia with the beleaguered cloud gaming service set to remain live for players up until the 18th of January of 2023. For those ones playing at home, that's a little more than three months' time from now. Three months. So Stadia's misfortunes are, of course, well-documented. Despite initial praise for the service's streaming capabilities at launch in 2019, a slow problematic rollout meant Google failed to capitalize on initial consumer interest. The extent of Stadia's failings started to become clear when the company announced it was closing its first-party game development studios less than 14 months after launch, with subsequent reports claiming the streaming platform was missing its targets for monthly active users by hundreds of thousands. And while Google continued to insist Stadia was alive and well as 2021 progressed, reports claimed it had deprioritized the consumer-facing side of its game streaming platform, having largely shifted its focus to selling the service's underlying technology to third parties. And now, as Stadia's three-year anniversary in November approaches, Google has finally pulled the plug. While Stadia's approach to streaming games for consumers was built on a strong technology foundation, Stadia Vice President and General Manager Phil Harrison wrote in a new blog post announcing the news, continues to say, it hasn't gained the traction with using uh, with users that we expected, so we've made the dis- difficult decision to begin winding down our Stadia streaming service. However, while Stadia's consuming face, uh, consumer-facing operations will cease in January, Harrison says Google will continue offering its game streaming tech to industry partners. The underlying technology platform that powers Stadia has been proven at scale and transcends gaming, he explained. We see clear opportunities to apply this technology across other parts of Google, like YouTube, Google Play, and our augmented reality efforts, as well as make it available to our industry partners, which aligns where we see the future of gaming headed. In light of this week's news, Google says it will be refunding all Stadia hardware purchases made through the Google Store, as well as all game and add-on content purchases made through the Stadia Store. It expects to have the majority of refunds completed by mid-January 2023, and more details are available via its help center. Holy guacamole, Miss Hart. Mm. So this has uh, been put to bed, put to death, less than three years after it was announced it's going to have the doors closed from the service in less or a little over three months at time of recording. And they're going to refund all purchases made. Yeah. This is billions of dollars down the toilet. Billions with a B. Holy moly, this is huge. I'm assuming the refund thing is definitely them covering their asses. Like I'm sure that they're like there's some kind of clause or something that because they're not fulfilling they're not fulfilling a, a service that people were bought into, I guess, that they have to kind of do the actual refund. Oh, unless it is just a good, like a good faith kind of thing. But mm-hmm. uh, I liked what Stadia was trying to do. I really, really did. I, I liked the idea. I liked the concept. But there was just too much data involved in making this a accessible service. Like mm-hmm. just the the requirements of internet and then like the data usage in order to just play simple games, it just it just did not it just didn't add up and it was gonna be expensive for most people. So you already have a a service here that just isn't for a good majority of people. So you've already cut down your you know, your possible client base. So you already shot yourself in the foot once. And then I guess it just, as things went on, it just got worse and worse. Yeah, like like on that data topic, I think it was, what, five gig an hour, I think it consumed it or something, something like horrid. that? It was a very, very hefty beast from a resourcing perspective. And I think, you know, it's just due to whatever compression algorithm they're running in the back end there. But yeah, it's, it's a shame because when this was announced, it was exciting and cool and new. And I think just poo-pooing Stadia for the sake of it is not, healthy like it sucks that they've fumbled the ball so heavily the last couple of years you know constant games were getting delayed there was no communication to market 
they didn't really have any big AAA tentpole games to pull people in as well. Mm. They were either bringing out games that were already out on, on traditional platforms from several years ago or some of the little games they were releasing just weren't quite there. But they really did push this cloud narrative forward in a way. Like on the back of this, you know, we've got an xCloud, yeah. which has been great and continues to be supported and looks to be the way future for cloud gaming across the ecosystem as a whole at the moment. And I think a lot of that comes off the back of Google getting ahead of Microsoft and announcing Stadia and doing this big push. So I think, you know, you've got to hat tip them for having a crack. Yeah. Uh, the, the, con- the controller and the ecosystem look great. Obviously, in Australia, we never got it because our ni- ni- internet is just up to shit anyway. Oh, yeah. But I was very envious when you told me that you guys pre-ordered it well. when it was first announced. and subsequently cancelled yeah. pre-order, but like I, I really wanted to to play with that that um that technology but wasn't meant to be and it sucks because seeing all the all the backlash and the other uh, people coming out of the woodwork on this where a lot of these studios that have been working on these games for potentially the entire time that stadia's been out didn't get the memo. nothing internal. There was no email. There was no phone call. They heard about it just like we did through through a news article and a press release. And now they're potentially you know out of jobs. What's happening with these games that were, were slated to release this year and next year? So there's a lot of deflation, I think, amongst these people, and rightfully so, because they put blood, sweat, and tears into making a game that could be something. And now that this platform that they're making it for is dead in three and a bit months. Like, I'm hoping... Some of these games might get picked up by other studios or land on other bits of product and hardware because that's the ripple effect that sucks as well. Like the people that were invested and putting time and money into trying to make it a thing are now just left out in the rain. Oh, exactly. Like the the thing that Stadia depended on was obviously having a range of games available into their library. Um, So I, I could only assume that the studios that were already building out games exclusive for the stadia maybe um we're already kind of given a pitch of that like they are doing a service for stadia they are going to have this exclusivity they're going to have you know that support um and then obviously when you probably sign up with the platform that hey we we will publish your game or we'll push your game onto our our platform you're not really gonna keep keep searching especially if you're probably a little little studio you're trying to set you know set yourself up and then to have mm-hmm. the rug essentially pulled from underneath you and leaving you with nothing like that's 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 low that's really really bad it's, it's very disheartening and it's funny like i saw another article just this morning where hideo kojima wanted to make a game for stadia and it was going to be like a a dotted line sequel or or tie into the Death Stranding universe and having someone like Hideo attached to something like this would would get some eyes and interest on the product. But Phil Harrison, the GM and VP of Stadia, pulled the pin on it. He said, no, we're not interested. And that, I don't know if, you know, that was because Hideo said, I need a budget. (laughs) Give me all the time in the world and all the money I need. Yeah, the game will come out between now and 2035, but it's going to be great when it does, you know. To be fair, that but is a quite funny. a gamble, especially if you're already on the brink of shutting down the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, but like connecting the dots as well, because obviously Stadia cloud-based streaming platform, mm-hmm. the announcement was made at the Microsoft and, or Xbox and Bethesda yeah. showcase that Hideo is making a cloud-based game with, you know, exclusivity to Microsoft They've probably, he's probably just taken that idea from Stadia and went, yo, Phil Spencer, what's up, my brother? You interested? <laughs> and this is how it's all come about. I really so hope that's how there it you went. go. I really hope that's how it went. Yeah, called him up. What's up, my brother? Phil went, yo, Hideo, what's happening? Hang on, I'm just in a live call right now. There's a statue of Ludens from your studio in the background. We're already planting the seeds and let's make some magic together. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, Stadia's loss is Microsoft gain in that regard. It seems like but, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's scary to think of the money that Google has lost on this thing. Oh, yeah. The fact that they're paying everybody back with purchases made through the Google store and the Stadia store. Like, I'd love to see by the end of January what that final figure is because it would be huge. And now people have the Stadia controller as well. Although I think it was PC 
compatible. I think you could use it on Steam, but they did have their own controller. So it looked pretty. Oh, I like the look of it. It's all right. Yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah, Google Stadia, lest we forget. Bum, bum, Less bum, than bum. three years into its uh, life cycle, pin pulled. And yeah, you've got until January to get your Stadia fix in, listeners. And then after that, he's gone. Yeah. Very, very sad. But let's uh, change the tone of this episode with this. Tweet of the week. And this tweet comes via way of at Joel McHale. And he has tagged a whole host of people, which we'll talk about in a second, with the graphic. And it just reads as follows, dot, 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 and a movie. So overnight, Miss Hart, they have confirmed that Peacock and NBC have paid up to Dan Harmon and co and are going to be bankrolling the inevitable, thank you God, community (laughs) film. So obviously the six seasons and a movie was the, the tagline that has been going on since just about the show's inception and we've gotten the six seasons and now we finally get a movie. It's interesting though because I've seen a couple little like um, media releases and things and everyone is mentioned as far as returning bar Donald Glover and Yvette Nicole Brown. So uh, two of the lead stalwarts, even though John McHale's tagged them in that tweet yeah. and he also tagged Gillian An- or Gillian Anderson yeah. instead of <laughs> Gillian Jacobs. In the tweet, which was humorous in itself, everyone else is coming back apparently bar Donald Glover and Yvette Nicole Brown, no. which sucks. I, like, I love like all the other characters as well. Like They're great. But if that's true, if you're going to make the movie, you have... You want them all. You want them all, yeah. You, you know, it's like Pokemon. But yeah, I, did, I didn't hear that, that that was speculation that we're actually not getting these two people that are, have been tagged. Like then again, you know we're not obviously going to get um, X Files. Um, once I'll oh, make Gillian yeah. Anderson, yeah. <laughs> but, although wouldn't it be great? It'd be very Britta. Oh, it'd be so good. A little Scully crossover. Maybe Mulder bring David Duchovny in as well. Mm. A little alien spin off in the movie. I'm also curious how this works as a movie. I know we've all wanted it because obvious reasons, but I'm like, how does this work as a movie? Like, is it going to be that like like Greendale's going to get shut down and they're going to try and keep it going or I don't know. Um, but like, I'm still still excited for it. I, this means I need to watch it uh, community again and just get to experience all that goodness of such a, such a weird specific time capsule of like happiness um, mm-hmm. of like late 20s, I guess, mid late 20s. Yeah, mid mid twenties, early ish twenties. Like this this show wrapped up in twenty fifteen, so we're getting oh, a movie okay. seven years <laughs> later, which I am <laughs> so excited for and I hope that they do end up getting the full cast back because it would just not be the same. Like even the later seasons when uh Donald Glover and Yvette Nicole Brown sort of did step away from it, the show was still fine, but it was just missing that complete heartbeat. And yeah. I want it all. Even if we get some kind of Chevy Chase looking down from, you know, magic heaven or whatever the hell. Like, you know, just a little nod even to him somewhere in there. Like, I want this to be done right. I don't want it to be half assed like some of the later content in community. So I hope it's done well and I hope it is respectful to the original source material. And yeah, I just want the whole cast, but I'm so excited. It was the best news to fall to sleep to last night. And I'm uh, over the moon, Miss Hart. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. Um, yeah, I just want to hear, I want to hear more, but then I don't want to hear too much, if that makes sense. <laughs> so I wouldn't even be sad if they weave in like a good portion of another paintball episode in here somehow. This is one like two hour long paintball episode. <laughs> Although technically it, <laughs> it was always work. two episodes, wasn't it? But yeah. It was so good. So good. But yeah, shout out to everyone involved in that. Could not be happier. Great news and a really good uh, cherry on top of a pretty depressing THG based new Sunday so or Saturday so oh no it is Sunday it is a Sunday but we're recording on Saturday I'm confusing myself with desserts and days now oh no Maybe miss heart <laughs> but community and a movie on its way coming to Peacock slash NBC in the near future huzzah but if you don't want to wait until uh, that comes out we got you covered New releases and events. As far as new content dropping between the dates of October 3 through to October 9, tons of stuff making its way to the small screen via the streamers. 
The Great British Bake Off Season 13 is dropping, Miss Hart, as well as all the other 12 seasons dropping all at once on Binge and the other streaming platforms. We've got Reginald the Vampire Season 1 making its way to Prime Video. Nailed at Season 7 on Netflix, The Midnight Club, which I am super excited for coming to Netflix, and the Hellraiser reboot film, which looks all kinds of creepy, disturbing, s and Nightmare fuely, and they've um, you know gender bended pinhead. So we've got a female pinhead um, jumping into that role for the first time in the franchise's history, coming out on Hulu. So it's going to be out on Disney Plus. Nice. So uh, get your Hellraiser fix after watching I don't know Paw Patrol, and then jump straight on into Hellraiser. Well, kids, you know it's Halloween. Like there's this Halloween movie here called Hellraiser. I think it'll be nice for the family to watch. Let's just. Uh, oh. Apparently, it's got a puzzle in it. That sounds fun. Oh, uh, yeah. There's a wacky. Mm, Cenobites. Mm, there's mm. a wacky character called the Chatter. Is that what he's. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like he's very oh. cold. God. It is. It is a time. I don't know if, like, if you Zoe? haven't seen Hellraiser. Yeah, <laughs> Arts and Craft. Yeah, the Nanas stumble onto that as well. Oh, it's. It's interesting, and, it, and if it can capture that same atmosphere and tone as the original, you know, the subsequent sequels, give or take them, but, uh, yeah, the first one was just very special and very disturbing, and I think we're going to get a lot of that disturbing vibe in the new Hellraiser film coming out on Hulu slash Disney Plus this coming week. Love it. As far as things coming to the big screen, we've got Don't Worry Darling, mm. the uh, very controversial film that uh, Olivia Wilde has... Uh, Helmed, and we've got a whole hope of actors and actresses that seem to love and hate each other equally. Also got Amsterdam, which is another period piece film. The cast is huge, really impressive cast. And Miss Hart, the last one I've just thrown in, because this fucking franchise will not die. They've made another Wog Boys movie. Wog Boys Forever comes out this week. Nick Giannopoulos is back they? again. How old are they? I, it's got to be 50. I old. remember, though, like watching the first Wog Boy movie... I wouldn't say it was a regular rotation. I like. I felt like that someone in my family enjoyed it enough, like having that kind of cultural mix Australiana to it. So it, it like kind of sat next to like the castle. So oh yeah, yeah. Yep. But I can't believe they're still making movies. I can't remember if this is the third or the fourth one they've made now. Like there is there is a Wog Boy franchise going on here, and are they still making Fat Pizza? Yes. They are? Yes. But like it's not called Fat Pizza. They've got like a spin off with other characters oh, okay. in other areas. And it's just it's another one. Like it cannot die. It's... And apparently neither can Wog Boys because uh yeah, we've got Wog Boys Forever coming out this week. Uh the trailer it's a time. I'm gonna look it up now. I have to see how old these how old these guys are. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's interesting. And as far as games coming out this week, we've got Dakar Desert Rally coming to just about every platform. Overwatch 2, which is free to play, as we have mentioned on the podcast a few times well, coming out on the 4th of October. We've got Deathverse, Let It Die coming to PC. And then we've got a couple of Switch ports in Near Automata and No Man's Sky on October 6th and 7th, respectively. But Miss Hart... <laughs> Anything else you wanted to shout out? I know we've dropped something and we alluded to it earlier in the pod as far as closing words here before we uh, shut down this studio for another week. Sorry, I'm just like distracted because I'm like, I watched Nick Giannopoulos in Acropolis now. Like I like that's 1980, Ooh, yeah. like well, 1989. But I was like, man, this guy's been around forever. Speaking of forever, but kind of also not, um, Scorn is coming out earlier. In a sea of news of constantly hearing about games getting pushed back, we're getting one early, which is a lovely Halloween surprise miracle. Yeah, like it's it's pushed forward from the 21st of October through now to the 14th of October. I'm so excited. A lot of people are starting to share their, their initial hands-on impressions mm-hmm. of the game. And the fact that no one can sort of land on exactly what this game is, is fantastic to me. And... The, just the constant, you know, I think we've used the term here a few times on this pod today. It's, it's unsettling. It, it really I is. wait. It really, really is. I'm trying to find, like, there was a really... Okay, so it's a skill up. 
Oh, yeah. His uh, video review of his first impressions was, I'm very into whatever the fuck Scorn is, um, which is, I think, a pretty good description of um, someone's review of the game. So looking forward to it. It's going to be it's going to be it's going to be weird, but it's going to be going to be so weird. And be sure to hunt down the the parody trailer they've done where they've used the It's Corn song oh, for... <laughs> yeah. It's so good. It's so it's perfectly gone. paced. <laughs> it has the juice. <laughs> it has it's the juice. so good. Uh, but yeah, 8 Nation, that brings us to the end of THG 301. Just want to also say thank you to everyone, um, all your lovely messages and everything in regards to episode 300 and our celebration and just all the lovely messages that we received congratulating us. Um, it was lovely. It was uh, it was actually a, a nice little little surprise during the week and just seeing everyone's lovely kind words and everything that they had to say. So um, really, really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for supporting us and continuing to support us. Could not agree more with that. Yeah, it was very, uh, very heartwarming and, and touching, and yeah, means a lot to the both of us here. And uh, yeah, didn't mention in the the new releases, but obviously, Pax Australia is next weekend. Oh yeah, here in Aww. AU down here in Melbourne, Victoria. We're going to miss that you're not there, Miss Hart. But uh, listeners, if you are poking around Pax next weekend, I'll be predominantly over at the Audio Technica booth. So be sure to pop on over, say hello, and uh, yeah, see if we can catch up for a a bite or a beverage over PAX weekend because uh, I'm very excited to see everybody again because it's been a few years since we've had a big face-to-face event. So uh, yeah, don't be a stranger next weekend at PAX Oz if you see me kicking around there. Yeah, everyone take photos and tag 8-Bit if you've got, uh, if you're near the AT booth and so I can follow the hashtags and all the social media and feel like I'm there. As much as hell I yeah, can. Hell yeah, hell yeah. You'll be, you'll be there in spirit, Miss Hart. But yeah, that brings us to the Tequila. end of episode 301 of The Hungry Gamers. Uh, listeners, thanks for just being awesome. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, us and all the other podcasts you listen to on the regular. But until next time, 8-Bit Nation, much love. And stay hungry. You've been listening to The Hungry Gamers, one of many gaming and geek culture related podcasts from the 8-Bit Collective over on 8bit.net. Check out more episodes on your podcast service of choice. And while you're there, please be sure to rate and subscribe. Until next time, boys and girls, stay hungry. Stay hungry.